I want to thank the organization here for having invited me for the second time. It is 20 years ago since we met. But um, I'm very happy to see known faces, old friends, and make new friends during these days. I'm going to speak about a difficult subject with a terminology which is a little artificial, huh? because I had to summarize 14 pages, and so you will get a handout to make it easier to follow. The headline of my presentation is The Ideological Construction of Singhala Buddhist Ethno-Nationalism by Semantic Displacement. Let me first uh, point out one thing of a former speaker who rightly emphasizes the, necess the necessity of a, a, a study of long durée, of a long historical perspective, which makes it evident that the present atrocities against the Muslims is only a part of a long uh, history of atrocities. Huh? When I started in 1970, I took over from my teacher, Heinz Bechert, who studied at that time uh, militant Buddhist movements from the 1940s onwards. So I continued with the study in 1970s, and I could list more than 100 Singhala Buddhist militant movements. Huh? Not all were directly violent, but it gave me the impression that there is a continuity. Of course, we can go further back to the colonial period where much of the inspiration has come for the present time, and also to the Wangsik tradition, the tradition from the chronicles, huh? the Mahavangsa, the Deepavangsa, and all these things which were very anti Tamil. Huh? So, um, with this long perspective, uh, we get another impression of the, of the strength of this uh, ethno nationalism. Singular Buddhist ethno nationalists rationalize the ownership of the territory of the unitary state by retrieving nationalist and or Buddhist concepts from the past of the anti-colonial struggle in large, part, large parts of Asia. For example, the term Bhumiputra, son of the soil. Uh, it is the soil where the Buddha allegedly trod three times. In the Mahavangsa, it is told that the Buddha flew to Sri Lanka three times. Having been turned against colonials, now the designation Bhumiputra was turned against Tamils. Then we have another concept. Uh, it is in Pali, Ekachatra, one umbrella. It is a metaphor for the unitary state now. And um, further on, we have the concept of Dhammadipa, which is a canonical concept, true, but it was later translated wrongly as island of the Dhamma. It's a wrong translation. It is no translation at all. Um, it is a kind of uh, transcreation, we usually say, huh? when um, a translation is fanciful. Um, and um, then the real uh, translation uh, of Dhammadipa 
means having the Dhamma as light, and it is mentioned in the canonical texts, which are classified as a Buddha language. So it has nothing to do with the island at all, huh? because the word Deepa, you know, has the double meaning of island and of light. Huh? But in the uh, ethno-nationalist tradition, they have chosen uh, island for Deepa, huh? which is a wrong translation. Then we have uh, the word Siala Deepa. It doesn't exist in the canon at all. Uh, but it started to be used in the centuries uh, from our time reckoning. So it is an old word, but it was not used as in the present sense. It was a toponym, that means a name of a territory, of an island. And this name, as a toponym, became, so to say, the name of all inhabitants in the island. So all were Singhalas, were independent of, if they spoke Tamil or Singhala or any other language, it's a demonym. Huh? And it was used as a demonym in the historical tradition. But in the modern tradition, this has been made into an ethnonym. That is, uh, the Singhalas are one specific group against the Tamils, who are not Singhalas. Huh? So we have this change from toponym to ethnonym, and then uh, Again, what is happening nowadays is that this ethnonym, so to say, is expanded over the whole island. So the Singhalas alone shall be in this island. Huh? So then this ethnonym becomes a demonym again huh? uh, as a final creation of so-called harmony where no other minorities exist in the island. So these modern translations can be described as transcreations or as semantic displacements. Um, they are pushed ahead and correspond to political religious interests. In the Chronicles, we also find an allusion to a list of 16 places that the Buddha allegedly has visited, including Nagadipa in the Tamil North. All these uh, Buddhist conceptual rationalizations are instrumentalized for the achievement of a political aim, namely the unitary state. Uh, this is done by Singhala Buddhist ethno-nationalists. I want to uh, state here clearly that I do not talk about Buddhism. I speak about a special group within Buddhism, namely political Buddhists. And then you have Buddhist politicians, which is different. They try to transfer Buddhist values into society as much as uh, Christian politicians try to transfer Christian values in society. Huh? And then we have the renouncers, huh? those who renounce societies at all. So political Buddhism is only one third of Buddhism. Huh? So um, please don't um, generalize uh, Buddhism to nationalism over the whole sector. Huh? Now, they call their own ideology the Jataka Chintanaya. You know all this, national ideology. Yeah? Uh, and then there's another word, which is very interesting, a, a self-representation. Um, self it is Singhalatva. Singhalatva was popularized by Nalin de Silva, who is one of the best-known um, 
ethno-nationalists um, in the modern history. Yeah? And he coined this, he didn't coin it, he popularized it. And he appealed to our understanding of what Hindutva is. Huh? So he made, a, so to say, an analogy to Hindutva, Singhalatva. Huh? And you all know what Hindutva is, so I don't have to go into this. Now, this ideological program incites to verbal and physical aggression. I say incite. I do not say it is the main cause, uh, the root cause, so to say, of uh, this uh, aggression. Uh, but I must uh, say that this ideology attains a certain degree of autonomy. So um, uh, it can, uh, so to say, incite people uh, independent of the awareness of the real causes of it. Huh? You know, Friedrich Engels, he said against Marx that uh, ideology is not only an epiphenomenon, it can be also attain a certain degree of autonomy, and that is what has happened in Sri Lanka. But the real causes, you know, you have in a document which is uh, nowadays of high value. It is the confession by Cyril Matthew. Cyril Matthew was the minister during Jaya Warner, who was one of the organizers of the Black July in 1983. And he wrote uh, a kind of confession, I see it as a kind of confession, where he explains why uh, Sinhala people hate the Tamils, huh? and that is because of the competition on the market, on the economic market. Huh? So you have it in plain paper what motivated him as the leader of uh, this kind of aggression. Finally, I only want to say this, we cannot exclude that some people do not instrumentalize the concept Tamadipa, but they honestly believe in the Vangsik promise of the Buddha that the island will come under one umbrella, which is the modern unitary state, and that non-Buddhists like Shaivas, Muslims and Christians are an obstacle to the promises realization. What I want to say is that the ideology from the Wangsik tradition in modern interpretation is so strong huh, that it resembles actually a kind of religion, excuse me. Huh? Uh, there is an ultimate concern for an ultimate aim, huh? and uh, this uh, makes it related to a kind of religion and uh, where belief is important. Huh? And this makes it very difficult to get rid of it. Huh? Thank you. Namri.